um, this actually gives me an opportunity to say something about the architecture of the next uh, this session and the next two as well. Uh, I want to begin by thanking Jean enormously for trekking over from the law school into a community that she is not particularly familiar with, but I hope will become more so over the course of um, coming months, if not at this very conference. Um, so, you know, to some extent, we talk about interdisciplinarity without querying disciplines and how they relate to one another. And if you're having some set of conversations, it's good to know who your neighbors are. And increasingly, STS scholars while developing their own identities, as we'll see over the next few days, have also been developing their identities precisely through conversations and communications of different sorts with different contiguous disciplines. And we thought that it would be an interesting way to begin this meeting to have some of our um, close colleagues from other neighboring fields who are actually versed in STS ways of thinking to engage with us, but not in a kind of abstract way, which tends to go nowhere because people get caught up in definitions and so on and so forth, rather in a more concrete way around very specific pieces of writing. So this session and the next two will both be organized, on, well, all three are organized around uh, already extant, or in the case of this one, soon to be forthcoming um, books that explicitly try to have STS-based conversations with other fields. Uh, now, I, um, as many of you know, was uh, trained in law at the school <coughs> where Jeannie teaches, and in fact, a guest taught at the very school where Jeff Kaiser teaches. Um, but nevertheless, uh, in spite of having the right to put a JD after my name and and used to the Massachusetts bar and not considered, and don't consider myself a card carrying lawyer anymore. <laughs> Nevertheless, of course, all of the work I do in science studies is deeply influenced by the bar in one way, shape, or form. Uh, and yet, that way, shape, or form is not necessarily in ongoing conversations with the law. Uh, so, several years ago, to talk about the history of the specific book that will be using as a gateway into conversation. Um, soon after I arrived back at Harvard, I applied to the National Science Foundation for a training grant, which is one of the ways in which NSF has fostered STS studies. And the training grant was called Reframing Rights, which is also the name of the forthcoming volume. Um, and the subtitle was Constitutional Implications of Technological Change. Uh, so the idea was that we would bring in uh, students from any field, any area, not necessarily law, who wanted to explore questions and issues arising at the boundaries of science and technology and legal issues. It was, we had in mind that the technology should be kind of... Uh, so the other intersections with law proved much harder to develop under that rubric of, of constitutional implications. Um, however, over the course of some seven-ish years, quite a lot of very interesting people passed through here, and a very high fraction of them are now gathered together as contributors to this volume. Um, and the volume itself has an intellectual history, which is that we were not actually trying to come up with some kind of code word that summarizes the theoretical contributions of the volume, and yet after we talked for a very long time about the extremely disparate uh, projects that people had under that broad rubric of constitutional changes, or, you know, constitutional implications of technological change, we came up with the idea of bio, bioconstitutionalism. Uh, so what is that all about? And a question, obviously, for Doug is, does it make any sense if you're coming at a book like this out of legal debates and legal thought rather than out of STS debates and STS thought. So um, I think we were all struck at the way that the characterization of the human has been changing in our time, and of course, part particularly the availability of genetic characterizations. I remember the first time I heard about a, an arrest warrant being issued for a DNA fingerprint. And, you know, it 
jolted me in the way I think it would jolt any STS scholar because this was a metaphysically profound moment. I mean, what does it mean to issue an arrest warrant for a DNA fingerprint? You know, you're, you're saying something about human identity there. Uh, and it's one thing to wave your hands and say, oh, this is just reductionism or whatever, but, uh, but it's more than that. So I, a few years later, I actually had the experience of hearing the man who was responsible. It was in Wisconsin in the days when Wisconsin had public servants that the rest of the country looked up to, in a sense. Um, but anyway, he was an extremely dedicated um, prosecutor, and he was absolutely distraught at the idea that people perpetrated sex crimes involving young women, and then they would disappear with that miraculous ability to disappear that America offers, and they couldn't be caught while the statute of limitations was still effective, and so he wanted to get there and nail these people in a way that would bring them within the ambit of legal thought and legal process before this kind of erasure through loss of identity happened, and the DNA fingerprint allowed him to do that. So listening to this man talk about these issues, you couldn't simply wave your little banner of genetic reductionism and think that you were telling the whole story. Much more what was involved, we thought, was that in the very effort to rewrite who the human is and how we should think about human identity and so on and so forth, um, you were actually changing foundational notions about the relationship of human beings with such powerful state entities as law enforcement, but not only <coughs> law enforcement. Um, so the book that came together out of all of this consists at one level of an extremely eclectic collection of essays. And people looking at it would say, you know, why is an essay about the nitty gritty details of European parliamentary politics sitting in the same book as uh, an essay about uh, how judges deal with uh, claims of uh, a right to post-conviction DNA um, testing or an essay about uh, the eugenic policies of California mental hospitals uh, in the early part of the 20th century. So bioconstitutionalism is an attempt to put a cover term on all of this which says there is a way to look at this set of transformations and the way is broader than the case study. So this is specifically a repast against the people who say STS is nothing but a collection of topical case studies. But whether such an attempt to get to a meta level works or not is something I think we have to work out as any STS scholar would see in the practice. I mean, does it make sense to other people? Is it the kind of conversation you can have? And how does it relate to ongoing conversations about constitutionalism in, after all, the field that considers itself the custodian and guardian of that conversation, namely law. I mean, so how, when lawyers talk about constitutionalism, do they have in mind any of the kinds of things that we STS scholars have in mind under that kind of rubric? So it's all experimental, which is one of the exciting things about doing STS at this moment, but I think the experimentation really advances to having conversations with people like Jeannie and Doug who are immersed in the intellectual culture and practices of law schools but who read widely and who therefore bring to our discussions a kind of informed richness that we would not have otherwise. I'll say a couple of words about Doug himself uh, which will not do justice to his, uh, his whole identity at all, but they are salient. One is that he spent some time at Cornell Law School and therefore was, um, came into contact with science and technology studies at Cornell, and maybe he'll say a couple of words about that, so he's not your any old law professor, <coughs> but actually one who has been in conversation with specific people even in this room who are from Cornell. But the second thing is that Doug has written one of the most, um, for me, transformative works on environmental regulation that I've seen in a long time, and it's called Regulating from Nowhere, and you'll recognize the STS scholars talking about views from nowhere that um, um, you know, sort of resonate with Doug's title, and it's, it's a very constructivist, in my view, attack on the practice of cost-benefit analysis in environmental regulation, and in the book, there's actually a chapter on genetic knowledge, 
And so I think Doug's approach is extraordinarily congenial to that of many people in the room, and I'm eagerly awaiting his remarks on the book. Thank you. Um, it, it's such a privilege to be a part of this event. I owe a great deal uh, in terms of my intellectual growth and my personal satisfaction as an academic to the work of uh, science and technology studies in general and to the work of Sheila Jasnoff in particular, um, which I did become familiar with through my Cornell connection after spending a few lonely years there locked in a law school with no intellectual comrades. I stumbled upon uh, Sheila's band of former students and other, um, other friends there. So to be identified as a potentially constructive, perhaps even welcome outsider in this event is enormously gratifying. I'm primarily an environmental law scholar. To think about the legal control of the environment is deeply problematic because it entails the construction of a legal account of something that is literally everything. And not just everything now and here, but everything in time. This task not only exceeds law as programmatic, it questions the very intellectual basis of that programmatic. Law works through practices of abstraction and purification. We take one problem, we isolate it, we think about it, and we endeavor to regulate it. We identify one harm, and we purport to trace its causal origin to an action, which we then call a crime or a tort in an effort to sew up social order after rupture. We cordon off physical spaces in the world and call them property in an attempt to create spheres of private sovereignty and independence. We formulate civil disputes as conflicts between individual parties, rather than as civic theaters for the collective working out of that which plagues us. We construct a category of person that demarcates eligibility for legal subjecthood, and then we pretend that corporations are obviously in and the great apes are naturally out. Of course, flux and upset in these categories is always possible. As our moderator has shown in a wonderful book, Law's long attempt to construct the home as a private space beyond the reach of public influence has been unsettled by the successes of the domestic violence protection movement, with ensuing consequences that extend far beyond the goals of even that movement, some for good, some for ill. But notwithstanding the possibility of flux and upset in law's categories, law's capacity to function as law still very much depends on processes of abstraction, isolation, purification. In turn, actors within law, including legal academics, typically perform what Sheila has called an innocent positivism, in which we behave as if our foundational categories are coherent, stable, and normatively unproblematic, as if they have simply been given to us by a benevolent and indubitable God, or nature, or cohort of founding fathers. For reasons that are perhaps best left unsaid, I believe this positivism within law is a guilty, not an innocent one. I believe the impulse to exogenize contingency is at bottom a flight from agency and responsibility. <coughs> but I should stress that the impulse is an understandable one, for the alternative is to admit of not only dizzying degrees of conceptual freedom, but also a potentially limitless ethical demand, about which I'll say more in a moment. Reframing rights confirms my long-standing conviction that SDS has much to offer legal studies. Whether the reverse is true, I'm less confident, um, but perhaps we can take that question up in our discussion. Before I other, offer some other matters for discussion, let me just say at the outset that Reframing Rights is a true pleasure to read, not only because the chapters are so uniformly well-researched, well-written, and deeply probing, but also because the volume as a whole, at least in my view, has an uncommon level of thematic consistency. So to answer Sheila's question, for me, all of the disparate subject matters are tied together beautifully within the frame of bioconstitutionalism and co-production. This is also a very timely volume. Just two examples will suffice. Just this very Monday, the Federal Circuit heard arguments in a case that questions the ability to claim intellectual property rights over non-altered strands of genetic material, something which we had thought for the last two decades was a fairly well-established part of our law, but now seems to be put back into new contestation. And second, in this very state, uh, the Federal Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act has been supplanted by a much more sweeping Massachusetts Genetic Bill of Rights, both laws thus explicitly <coughs> acknowledging the bioconstitutional moment we have entered. Reframing rights brims over with insight and guidance for this moment. Uh, for instance, in the federal act I just mentioned, 
the preamble references American history of forced sterilization as a ground for regulating use of individuals' genetic information. The drafters of that act would have benefited enormously from reading Alex Wellerstein's chapter in the book on forced sterilization, which revealed that the practice in the U.S. was shaped as much by institutional design as by ideas about eugenics. As Wellerstein notes, the link between ideology and action is rarely direct, but instead is mediated by specific legal, social, professional, and organizational factors. Lawmakers can never eradicate those indirect and difficult to anticipate effects, but they can become <coughs> more self-conscious about their possibility. I want to raise four issues for possible discussion that occurred to me as I read the volume. And by way of warning, the last two are indulgently large issues. So first, I wondered about the book's crediting of biology, and in particular genomics, as the master field within which science encounters life, rather than an alternative field such as ecology. Every knowledge scheme, I think, contains an implicit teleology, one that imparts political content, and neither biology nor ecology are exceptions. The reductionism of genomics drills down in search of new powers of control for the benefit of humanity. In contrast, ecologists stress the emergence of system properties that can't be adequately predicted or explained through examination of system components alone. The former outlook tends toward technological optimism. The latter approach counsels humility, caution in the face of ine inevitable and often unpleasant surprise. I would argue that the former reductionist approach has been in the ascendant within universities and the larger social order for centuries, and this implicit disciplinary hierarchy has contributed, I would argue, to the creation of contemporary environmental threats. So in my work, I argue against uncritically returning to those same approaches for guidance when fashioning environmental laws and policies. But my work is obviously different from that of the reforming rights of authors. So I'm curious to know whether depicting genomics as science's master narrative on life is merely intended in the volume to be descriptive uh, or if instead some form of co-production might be at work in the volume itself. Second, I'm reminded of a quip attributed to the legal scholar Arthur Leff. Uh, he had taken later in his career a year's sabbatical to do graduate level coursework first in economics and then in sociology. And when later asked how he found the experience, he said it was like going from a desert to a swamp. <laughs> With all respect and affection, this is how I sometimes feel when I go from reading legal scholarship to SDS scholarship. <laughs> we face a sort of familiar trade-off between theoretical tractability and descriptive attractiveness. In my view, the frames of co-production and bioconstitutionalism are undoubtedly richer and more accurate depictions of our life world than those innocent positivisms that they overwrite. But what of their potential for prediction and prescription? Uh, or am I perhaps mistaken to surmise that social science can and should aspire to that role? Third, does STS need an ethics? If, as Sheila writes, the first duty of any state committed to the rule of law is to take responsibility for its people's lives, then there is a danger that the state will apprehend life only as what Agamben has called air life, as a material condition to be managed rather than a subject to be empowered. We see this in Maria Talachini, have I? Talachini. Talachini's chapter, where uh, informed consent procedures in the Zeno transplantation context suddenly shift from a focus on patient autonomy to one of risk management, constructing the patient as a potential threat that is subject to lifelong surveillance and possible quarantine. Even more dramatically, we see in Giuseppe Testa's chapter the deliberate design of a developmentally impaired embryo, carefully constituted so as not to qualify for moral considerability. Now, bioethics discussions often focus on the question of how we should limit genetic engineering technologies so they only promote therapeutic benefit rather than human enhancement, as if those two things could be distinguished. I personally am much more worried about genetic engineering of deprivation than I am of enhancement. Soon we'll be equipped to design new life forms that either meet or fail the tests for moral and legal recognition that we have established. Whether those tests involve the capacity to feel pain, to communicate, or to exhibit any other empirically demonstrable characteristic. Through what Sheila terms ontological surgery, 
we will be able to bring those life forms within or without the sphere of intrasolars. The extent of their suffering will therefore depend not on supposed ontological givens, but rather on moral will, stripped of theoretical apology. To decide to acknowledge another life form as a source of ethical obligation is not, I believe, to examine a set of empirical descriptions about that life form in order to see whether they measure up to some predetermined depiction of what an intersolder is. It is instead to find ethical obligation precisely in the unknowability of that other life form's interior world. To honestly encounter other life forms, we must remain open to the infinite possibilities of their existence. We must reawaken a sense of awe and incomprehension regarding the other's being. One that is infused with an awareness of unfulfillable responsibility, rather than with a desire for programs of thought and action that are total in their reach. We do not enter into the world as self-possessed liberal subjects already equipped with capacity of reason and discourse that enable voluntary, determined justice relations. Instead, we emerge into consciousness already hostage to the gaze of the other's face, already placed under an infinite ethical demand. So the view I just hinted at there is that of Emmanuel Levinas, uh, who placed ethics as first philosophy prior to ontology. For Levinas, subjectivity begins in awareness of an other who issues without words a most basic command, do not kill me, and wakes us to a world in which we inevitably fail but never shed that responsibility. So in Levinas' view, philosophy has to be reworked from the ground up so we never deny the infinite value of life. So we continually and solemnly confess our failure before this demand of the other. Without allowing ourselves to be shot through, in this sense, by the possibility of suffering of others, Ethics becomes susceptible to thematization, politics to rationalization, and even the most horrific neglect and abuse to normalization. Regard for other life becomes a matter of finding the correct line of moral considerability, the line that can't be rationally or empirically doubted, rather than a matter of openly experiencing the plea that cannot be denied. So that's a flavor of ethics as first philosophy, and as you can see, at least for me, it kind of gives me a sense of vertigo, it's not, it maybe nausea even in the technical sense. Uh, but I wonder whether STS invites an even more powerful sense of vertigo. For STS treats not only ontology as conceptually contingent and constructed, but also ethics. As Sheila writes of the chapters in Reframing Rights, nowhere in these stories do we, do we begin with firm ontologies or fixed ethics. So my third question is, how would you describe SDS's first philosophy if it's not ontology or ethics as familiarly understood? If STS does have a first philosophy, what is its ethical content? Finally, and relatedly, how would we describe STS's politics? One message I often find within STS scholarship is that the deficit model of public scientific engagement has to be reformed to better disclose the deficits of science itself. Unfounded belief in science's potential to avert the need for normatively fraught policy making has to be replaced by a more considered awareness of the demands that are rightfully placed upon and concomitantly powers rightfully reserved to citizens as democratic self-legislators. But what of democracy itself, also a technology, and one which rests on a signal moment of co-production, the moment in which a people is said to have expressed its democratic will to form a political community through a constitution that simultaneously is said to have received the people's assent as a mechanism of will recognition. So legitima legitimation of the constitution demands popular sovereignty, but pop the popular sovereign's will has to be discerned through principles of constitutional law that already somehow have been legitimated. This is a paradox that can't be resolved analytically. Instead, it simply lives on in the continuing and never completely successful efforts of the community to overcome its foundational tension, to demonstrate the continued vitality of the performative utterance, we the people, which first constituted the community as a community, even as it represented that community as somehow already formed. Membership thus, is always at issue in lawmaking. Every instance of social choice, no matter how mundane, raises anew the question, are we the people? 
As Reframing Rights makes clear, this foundational tension is now starkly revealed through matters such as cloned embryos and <coughs> xenotransplantation and the daunting membership questions that those matters raise. Will democracy survive this trial, this passage by way of the undecidable? And what role will the unblinking gaze of science and technology studies play in that trial? In addition to its essential task of highlighting contingency, constructiveness, and normative agency. Will STS scholars increasingly perform their theory through praxis, as Robert Doubleday and Brian Wynn have done in their chapter in which they describe experimental democracy efforts, or as Sheila has done most recently at the World Trade Organization and elsewhere? How will the field be affected when STS scholars increasingly are called upon by governments to assist in the moments and institutions within which co-production occurs, when the scholar's participation becomes no longer tacit but transparent? Sheila rightly notes that the normative agency of social actors is revealed by the irreducible contingency of life-law relationships. But what of the normative agency of STS scholars as social actors? when they not only reveal contingency, but also influence contingency's resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's start off with uh, Sheila, would you like to respond, or um, should we go to the audience? Um, well, let, let me just um, say a word. Well, one word is that a couple of the authors who are contributors to this volume are actually present in the room. Uh, I don't know if anybody's watching from afar, but, but um, certainly I see at least David Winnikoff and uh, Kash Sundarajan and Brian Wynn is somewhere not in my field of sight. Uh, so um, if they have uh, comments, I would really invite them to add things. Um, just on your um, list, Doug, I mean, um, so I think some of the, um, I mean, the question about whether environment is a, a better or different way to enter into these questions is obviously one that is very salient in my mind because the two areas I work on are actually the genetics, genomic side of things and the environmental side of things. And I think that they pose very similar kinds of questions about identity, belonging, ethics, all of the things you raised, but perhaps at different scales and implicating different kinds of institutional formations. So that's, you know, it's very much a kind of conversation to keep on having. Um, uh, not that, you know, why do you in a book on environmental cost-benefit analysis, throw in a chapter on genetics and genomics, and you know, there's, there's obviously a conversation to be had there that, that's important and significant. Um, on the swamp side of things, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, all sorts of visions of creatures wriggling <laughs> out of, in the back of my mind right now, um, but it's possible that going from artificial clarity to renewed clarity requires a passage through a swamp. So, so there's that to talk about, and I think it's very closely related to your question about questions about first philosophy and also politics, right? And so one could argue, and I'll leave this to others to comment on, that revealing those moments of co-production to people who are not significantly aware of them is already a political act. This is certainly something that I've argued over and over again in my writing, that um, by showing the moments, the situations, the processes through which the rigidities of a structure are actually put in place, one is actually performing something that's quite subversive. And I think STS scholars will know from their own life histories that because their work is often seen as subversive in that way, it's, it faces certain kinds of challenges. So I'm not sure that showing the swamp is not a profoundly ethical act, or to put it not in double negatives, I believe that showing the swamp is a deeply ethical act and also a deeply political act. For me, the key question in talk with, you know, with Jeannie on my left and you on my right is that it's something that you yourself said to me once, uh, which I don't believe for a moment, that you're just a 
pragmatic guy and you want to get things done and you're a law professor and a lawyer. Um, but supposing you were, you know, this is, this is the so what question, right? I mean, so not is the swamp ethical or political, which I think it plainly is, but once you've been in the swamp, how do you come out and what kind of so what's do you then pursue? And that's a place where I honestly think there's a lot of work to be done uh, between the people who are action-oriented and who think that they're put on earth because they can persuasively argue a case that's not being argued otherwise and, and make a difference. And, but how to build those connections, that to me remains a challenge. Yes, yes so to follow up David, on that. Oh. Um, please introduce yourselves. I did want to cop from UC Berkeley and I was part of the book project. Um, so as someone who does scholarly work in SDS as well as law and tries to actually do policy work or I'm asked to, my opinion on various things, um, I, think, I think it's hard. It's actually hard and I think it is a topic of conversation, has been and continues to be. Um, how do you as an, as an STS scholar engage productively in the world? Um, but one of the things I consistently come back to um, is building on what Sheila said. If part of our work is to denaturalize certain things, is to bring things out of a given, uh, a, a fixed given that wasn't in any way humanly produced or constructed and put together, um, once one can reveal the constructiveness of various things, even science or formations that combine science and other things, and reveal it to, to some extent to be a matter of contingency or choice, then, then that opens up um, a realm of action where one, one can ask, well, how should we take those choices? And to start brainstorming um, ways from a kind of process perspective um, and try to open up possibilities of dealing with the choices that we have that we've opened up. So one of the things I go to um, is the procedural route, it's not the only one. Uh, maybe it's because I'm, I'm a lawyer, but once we reveal certain things to be at stake and as choices, that opens up important questions about democracy and procedures and legitimate ways of resolving controversies. Um, and, and that in itself is an intervention with an ethics. It tends to be a democratic one, I would say. Uh, but that's one place uh, that I think many of us do go. If I if I could just interject a question there, I I, I think that's a, a very um, much a lawyer's approach, and of course one that I'm I'm very um, you know, have a lot of affinity with, and it, it just I wanted to raise this question because Doug at, at the end ended with the idea of the normative agency of STS scholars. Does the, as they get more involved in not only the theorizing and description, but of actually making prescriptions about policy. And I just wonder, is this turn to the procedural, right, which is clearly um, what lawyers do, is, is that the best we can hope for in the way that we think about STS and its normative vision, right? Is that basically what we're going to, that what lawyers do, that's pretty much what we're going to say SCS scholars are going to be able to do, and that that's the aspiration for getting out of the swamp? Sir, I think it's, well, it's a mistake to say that STS should have one ethic, right? So there's, a, there's an issue of individual ethics. So I think the question of, you know, once we reveal things to be constructed, we might have our own, as individuals, ideas about what's necessary, how we should necessarily engage and act on that arena. Um, so I don't think necessarily there's one set of ethical principles that comes out of uh, STS. It opens up uh, possibilities um, for individual ethics to even decide which things to open up. So there's, there's choice about which kinds of questions you want to open up, which is a kind of ethically driven choice, potentially. And then individuals can then act on it and be a strategic actor to try to get their values in or make sure certain things are, are taken into, into account. My, my fear on the um, going the procedural route, which obviously is an instinct um, for me as well, um, is that uh, you know that, that we can apply the STS lens to those 
technologies of democratic decision making as well. And so, you know, if we can think, lawyers tend to think normatively about procedures in terms of maximizing participation and democratic legitimacy, um, but we can have a more crit critical, subversive lens on those procedures as well. And, and we can find that outcomes of processes are going to be affected by the design of the processes and so on. Um, and, you know, one, one example that's on my mind very much now and was on my mind reading the Reframing Rights book is we have an Endangered Species Act that re requires our agencies to take steps to save species that are listed as endangered. And now that raises the prospect that we won't just have to conserve habitat for them, which is perceived to be their natural pre-European pre baseline, but we'll have to actually move them. We'll have to assist their migration to more suitable climates, in which case there's a question raised about whether they're the, the indigenous or the invasive. And, and you know, we, we don't actually know that that original congressional statute passed 30 years ago would have desired this result. Um, and we could ask our agencies to come up with participatory rulemakings or, or um, you know, miniature democratic conventions, or do, all, do all sorts of experimental procedures for trying to elicit renewed public focus on the issue. But I don't know, I don't know that I would have confidence in it. Yeah, so, um, but part of the problem, Doug, is, uh, you know, what was that original congressional intent in the Endangered Species Act, and is it even the same thing now, given that habitat conservation plans have been widely adopted as a mechanism to deal with certain kinds of uh, unspecified, you know, vague mandates that did not stand up to either political pragmatism of a certain sort or advancing knowledge of a, of a certain sort. Now, I don't think that STS scholars or indeed any human being should be held responsible for um, not knowing. I mean, for not knowing what the best solution or the archetypal correct solution ought to be under any given circumstances. So I don't know. I mean, how can I know whether a mandate to preserve biodiversity would adequately be served by what I call for shorthand a Blade Runner world in which we have now well-developed de cloning possibilities and a library of genes and an understanding of them with which we can bring to bring back you know, anything that ever existed and many things that never did. I don't know, I mean, is that something that's going to satisfy the human urge for biodiversity or do we have to nail down biodiversity to something that some people thought between 1970 and 1990 in the United States of America, led by a particular group of scientists who thought that you do biodiversity by measuring um, genes with little uh, handheld gadgets. Well, the gadgets came in much later, but anyway. Um, and so it's like saying, what is the democratic solution? Uh, you don't know, because you don't know what the democracy is on the basis of which you're forming the adjective democratic. Mm -hmm. So I think that part of the proceduralism, Jeannie, also, is that um, it, it is substantive at the same time. Mm -hmm. That is, it affords a place where you can continually reopen the question of what, what is the value that you're trying to preserve and protect. And of course, at a given moment, if you give me a binary choice, do you want to do this or that? Well, I'll probably waffle, but, but anyway, many people, would, <laughs> many people would not waffle and would say, I want to do this and not that and give reasons. You can't know whether the, this was the correct choice or that that was the correct <coughs> choice. I think there's actually a, an independent, positive value to saying that that kind of choice should always be more open, more transparent, but not, not then giving up on other questions like therefore who has the right to question it and are there epistemologically better bases for arguing or not. I mean, I think those questions are, are equally important as well. I would just deny that proceduralism is ever mere proceduralism. Mm -hmm. I think proceduralism is always in the aid of, or at least people who do it honestly, in the aid of opening up substantive arguments and possibilities and positions that people are arguing for. When we wrote our WTO brief, in which both Brian Wynn and David Winnicott were 
by co-conspirators that time, we actually did suggest that the European Union should adopt uh, the um, sort of Leventhal idea of administrative judicial review, I mean, so a kind of hard luck doctrine. So that wasn't the only procedural. It was actually saying, you know, here is a rule that, you know, is a better review rule when you've got an extremely diverse collectivity of states with their independent value structures and value systems. So I guess I would kind of gently resist that mere proceduralism label. <laughs> All right, I'm going to be a virtual member here, um, and this is a message from Tim Forsyth, who's uh, joining us on the live feed from London. He asks, why does it have to be a swamp metaphor? Isn't this replaying the point behind the book, We Have Never Been Modern, i.e., we have never been in a swamp, but at least we know we know it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's fair. I mean, it was a totally intemperate question, but I'm obligated to ask it as the representative of law. I mean, uh, I'm the bastion of reductionism. <laughs> In this way. <laughs> 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 I'm Kaushik Rajan, uh, University of Chicago. Um, also, I'm in the Reframing Rights volume, but was also um, David's fellow fellow with Sheila on the Reframing Rights project. We were contemporaries, so partners in crime of a sort. Um, uh, Doug, thank you for those very generous and generative comments. So this is going to be slightly ungenerous pushback for the sake of argument. Um, on, on, uh, on, on three scores, one, one of which is sort of minor and procedural, but, but the other two of which are more substantive. Uh, so that's, that's genomics is one, um, prescription in politics is two, and democracy is three, since you ended with that, right? So just, just a quick response on the question of genomics as master narrative, and I don't want to speak for everyone in the volume. But, but I do think that alongside the question of whether genomics or some other science stands in for life itself at a particular moment in time, it's also a more conjunctural question, which is the fact that there was a particular moment that a number of us, certainly myself, were responding to that was deeply marked by an imaginary of genomics and, and the role that it played. But I would suggest it was marked by an imaginary of genomics when we didn't necessarily know that it was as reductive as you make it out to be. In that genomics itself in the 2000s, in its quote-unquote post-genomic moment, has shifted to a radical embrace of things like contingency, ecology, you know, questions of epigenetics and systems biology are constitutive to the self-definition of genomics now. So, so rather than just it be a question of is this genomics or is this something else that we need to look at this through, I might suggest also that genomics is an interesting marker of a moment of tentative opening towards reflexivity within the fields that we were studying itself, where it was, where it was caught between a reductionist moment and a more self-defined complex moment with all of that, those attendant problems. Um, in terms of the question of prescription in politics, and you did this very gently, but I'm going to be ungenerous because I've heard less gentle sorts of attributions of the prescription question, as in, well, why don't you just be prescriptive? And I've heard that in the Kennedy School quite often. Um, <laughs> is in that I heard a sort of implicit statement that prescription in politics comes from above. and. Uh, and I do want to suggest that, that certainly in, in my thinking of the project of critique, because a lot of my work is in India, there is a commitment to also prescription to the quote unquote below, right? And so a lot of the people that I feel I'm writing for, not necessarily in any direct or intelligible sense with my academic writing, but in terms of the communities with which I would hope to forge a politics, are social activist communities and not necessarily policy makers from above. But that's not just to suggest a simple kind of binary between policy makers and activists, but also to suggest that that relationship itself is differently configured in different parts of the world. And so for instance, um, a lot of lawyers in India are the social activists. Um, there's an enormous amount of civil society engagement in the making of the law itself, including around techno-scientific issues, and that engagement is mediated by lawyers who are at the forefront of the battle line. So one of the most seminal pieces of legislation passed in India in the last couple of years was Article 377, which is finally an anti-discrimination law against homosexuality. And these were uh, pushed through 
by gay rights activists, but also gay rights activists who are deeply involved now in anti-retroviral politics and in politics against intellectual property protection of retrovirals through the WTO and so on. And so there's a way in which certain kinds of biopolitical communities are being forged from quote unquote below. And there's a way in which I would hope, though it's an ambitious hope, that STS type work, which does study above quite often, can serve as a mediator, facilitator, translator, where the prescription is a sort of strategic, tactical prescription to, to those whom we might want to see effect change. And so the, the, the last point then is precisely the question of the democratic, and that's just to reiterate the point that therefore the democratic is not similarly configured everywhere. And so, so I think, and, 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 and I'm saying this not just as an abstract sort of principle, but actually as a tangible sort of political construct. So I think, for instance, of this is just one quick vignette of um, in some of the field work that I was doing, debates in India around enacting new legislation on the lines of the U.S. by Dole Act. Right, and this is vigorously opposed by patient advocacy groups, especially um, antiretroviral groups. And the government called the civil society consultation where they had these groups in the room saying, you know, should we have this act? Why shouldn't we? And what do you want to do about it? And the patient advocate said, well, these are the reasons why we shouldn't be having this act because we have to think about innovation differently, blah, blah, blah. And the scientists, the science policy people basically said, oh, you people are talking rubbish because you don't know how the science works. And so there has to be patenting for the science to actually diffuse the society. And then they went on. And, and, and what the lawyers in the room did was they, they had the Constitution of India tucked under their arm and they pulled it out and said, well, you don't know how the Constitution works because what you're saying is illegal in the framework of the Indian Constitution. And so this is a bioconstitutional moment that's being forged in the field. And I'm saying this not just to suggest a simple opposition there between scientific common sense and legal common sense, but also to suggest that I wouldn't necessarily or easily imagine a situation where the US government, when implementing a technocratic act, would bring the patient advocates and the lawyers into the room to ask them about it. I wouldn't necessarily imagine the lawyers waiting around the US Constitution in the same way as a response to this. And that completely changes any idea that I have of what even a prescriptive politics as an SDS scholar would be if, those, if the theater is differently configured in the those are all extremely fair points. I mean, I, I should confess that the questions that I posed were really questions that I asked myself constantly. So I was using this as a therapeutic moment to try to <laughs> hear from you how you grapple with these challenges as well. And I, my scholarship, as Sheila knows, because she suffered it, um, it, it's very, it, it is very critical and deconstructive, and it doesn't often have clear take home prescriptive points the way most legal scholarship does. So, and that's something I face pushback on continually. Um, and I also conceive of my audiences in a, in a way very familiar to the way you described yours. Um, the one um, downside of this is that when I do try to offer uh, constructive prescriptive advice to, to those above, um, there's a problem in having been somehow typed as a more subversive element who's unlikely to actually offer concrete prescriptive advice. And I most recently sent a long list of very actualizable uh, improvements to the cost-benefit analysis order that the U.S. government uses to evaluate all uh, federal environmental health and safety regulations. I sent in my comments to an open call for comments, and the response I got back from the head of the, the OIRA office at OMB was, thanks, let me know if you have something concrete to say. <laughs> Brad, please come to the microphone and identify yourself. Uh, thanks very much, and um, I guess this is almost confessionals time now. And the, I think Could you say who you are? Yeah, I'm about to. <laughs> Brian Wynn from Lancaster University. So, in addition to David and Kashik, another author in the volume that you uh, reviewed. Uh, and I also want to thank you for that review. I think it was extremely insightful and helpful. So, um, that having been said, uh, I just wanted to elaborate actually on Kashik's response uh, on your question about the genomic um, narrative uh, that the book's built around. 
to point out also, the, in addition to those factors which Kaushik was describing about the genomic imaginary being a powerful imaginary of that time, of the last 20 years or so, that in addition to that, there was also, of course, a coincidence historically between the genomic imaginary's arrival and promotion and neoliberal capitalism mm -hmm. in the globe. And so there's a political economic dimension to the genomic imaginary's power and success. Success, success economically perhaps, success in terms of consequences, benefits, society, still to be seen. But nevertheless, I just wanted to point out that was an important part of the constitutional dimensions too that um, we were attempting to understand and clarify. And I also just wanted to, um, when I think about the swamp metaphor, um, I'm also really trying to return to those points with Sheila. Um, I just want to endorse Sheila's response to that question too about the ethics of STS. Um, and as somebody who gets involved in activism as well as academic scholarship on science and technology in society, it's obviously an important question, and I'm very pleased and grateful that you posed it. And I guess one of the points is precisely that point that she has made, that we have a responsibility, an ethical responsibility, as academic scholars, to tell it like we see it, to tell it like we understand it. So if we see it as being more contingent than it's actually described and attempted to be represented, and indeed enacted in the world, policy and politics and economics, then we have to tell it. And of course, telling it in policy worlds is very different from telling it in the classroom, in the lecture room, and in academic meetings of this kind. So that one is continually confronted with the ethical problem of how do you represent what you understand. And that is something where the register changes and the questions of the, you know, the relevance of the contingency dimension in itself changes. But ultimately, I would say, as somebody who's struggled with these questions for, I'm not going to count the years now, um, that ultimately it's an issue of, for me, exposing the challenges for democracy, which those areas which are increasingly being scientized by the, you know, the, well, let's, let's leave that aside for the moment, but the scientization processes which are intensely going on. And here I was struck by Dorothy Zinberg's comments in the earlier session about contrasting the idea that publics used to be deferential to science in this wonderful golden age of authority for science. And nowadays, everybody's skeptical at best, mistrustful at worst, and just oppositional. Uh, I don't think that's an accurate historical account of the situation. <coughs> Sociologists and historians have shown us that actually the so-called deferential years were not deferential at all. Mm -hmm. There was a question about mobilization and confidence to do so and the organization of explicit and <coughs> collective forms of skepticism or opposition. And nowadays there are many, many dimensions and domains of science in society where there is no skepticism or very little that can be seen as mobilized and activated and organized. It's there if you look for it, but that's a different question from the way in which Dorothy is characterizing it. So I just want to return to that point that actually we have a responsibility in STS of actually connecting our understanding of science with our understandings of publics because they are you know, they are so connected in ways which is, as the co-production thesis understands it, mutually reinforcing, mutually producing. And that, for me, is essentially the ethical responsibility we have. Not to be prescriptive in the sense of the philosopher's sense of telling us what to do, right. but of tell, it, 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 describing what the agenda and the responsibilities and challenges are for democracy. And if democracy isn't up to it, then I would suggest that is not STS's responsibility, that's democracy's responsibility. <laughs>
and all the qualifications that Kamshik was inserting about the differential character of democracy around the world anyway. Thank so, you. And the, I, I'm so happy that I baited you into the conversation. I was really <laughs> hoping to hear from you in particular. Um, because it, your chapter ends on what I found to be a very optimistic note after having shown all of the challenges of the UK GM agricultural consensus building efforts. You end with an optimistic note about a different process involving public input on scientific research priorities, which I've always thought is you know, one of the most enormously important moments of public decision making that gets the least amount of attention, at least in the United States. So I was emboldened by that. I will say though that like, like part of my reason for sharing your optimism was my sense of respect for you and your particular involvement. Um, because I, I have a sense of the great integrity with which you do try to tell it like it is. And, um, and I could imagine in that process, you're not allowing people to rest on, on their reductionisms or their naturalisms. You, you're forcing people back onto the rough ground uh, in a productive way. Um, but I, again, unless we start cloning Brian Wynn um, and spreading you out <laughs> to run these kind of workshops, I'm not, I'm not sure yet I see how we're going to get to that, get to that new future. Yeah, I, I'm of course against cloning <laughs> and, and particular human beings far stronger than regular human beings. And perhaps the optimistic note in that chapter, I'm looking at Sheila here, was um, introduced by my co-author Rob Double. <laughs> Sadly, he's involved in an STS meeting at the other Cambridge at the moment, uh, so can't be here. But um, no, that was a deliberate move. And the deliberate move was actually to give political impetus to that very move which was made by a British Research Council, the Biotechnology and Biosciences Research Council, in response to uninvited forms of public engagement, i.e. public controversy, from the streets and from the fields. And lots and lots of civil disruption, illegal, um, except that jury, juries did actually vote for the innocence of those parties who were involved in the direct action and disruption of farm scale trials and so on. So uh, the whole point of that optimistic tone to that particular experiment by the Biotechnology Bioscience Research Council in essentially responding to the opposition by saying there are alternatives in the science that aren't being recognized and that STS in this case is helping to articulate for society to see there is a democratic agenda here. What are the social purposes that, and the social needs to which science and technology are being devoted? And that is a big democratic agenda. And so just simply pointing to that as a possible agenda, and one which the BBSRC to their credit recognized, they didn't articulate it in those terms of course, it was very technical, it was about crop science and plant science and so on. But the very fact is, they responded quite clearly in the report, they responded to that democratic signal. And they did it, as far as I'm concerned, in an intelligent and a politically sensitive way. Where it will lead next is another question. There's, there is still a politics. There's so much more to say, but unfortunately we have to end this session and take a short break for, until the next one. Thank you.